Okay, welcome. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late on the recording, but I'll go over quickly, very quickly, everything. Um, so let me start my share. So I'll go over the exam, uh, the quiz. I'll let you look at the quiz. It was pretty. It wasn't that hard, I think. You just had to do a little algebra first. So don't forget for question two. We need to find the slope of the secant line. It went through one, four, and two, two. So we just did two minus four over two minus one and got negative two. We wanted to find the slope of the tangent line at x equals one. At x equals one, it's horizontal. So the slope of the tangent line is zero. And then for question three, if we take the limit as x approaches negative two, left and right, no problem, that limit is one. Okay, if we want to take the limit as x approaches negative one from the right, that plus sign up there means from the right. So that means we're only gonna be journeying from the right. Where do we head towards? What's the y-coordinate? Around. Any thoughts? Point eight. Negative eight point, negative eight. Yeah, it looks like about negative point eight sounds good enough. Okay. If you wrote negative point eight one or negative point eight two, that, that's close enough. That's closer, but I just wanted to see somewhere around that. Does not exist is wrong because this is a limit from the right. There's no problem from the right. Okay, limit as x goes to zero. What's going on with the sucker at zero? What's happening? Oscillating. It's oscillating. This doesn't have a limit. So it's a D and E. It's not an asymptote, and, but it doesn't exist either because it doesn't rest somewhere. If you're going from the left and the right, you're never gonna get anywhere, okay? This is actually a sine one over X is what I put into Desmos. Okay, as X goes to one, does a limit exist as X goes to one? No. One more guess? Yes. Yes. Having a hole is fine for limits. If you're heading from the left and your friend is heading from the right, are you going to be able to talk to each other when you get close to one? Yes. And where are you going to end up? Y coordinate about 0.8. Any questions on that? So holes are not problems with limits. Okay, as we'll see in a bit, they're problems with continuity, but not with limits. Okay, uh, the limit of f goes to two from the left. So that means we're walking from the left towards two and we're falling down forever. So what is the limit? Negative infinity. Yeah, negative infinity. Is that clear? Okay, and then the next question was the limit of f goes to two. Well, there you have to go from the left and the right and if you're going from the left and your friend's going from the right, are you gonna be able to say hi to each other? No, because you're gonna go way down into a hole and your friend's gonna go way up in the sky and you're not gonna even see each other. So the limit doesn't exist at X equals two. Any questions on for there? Okay, part B is state, the, state where it's not continuous and write down the type. So, for discontinuity, basically, I like to think about it as long as, if I don't have to lift my pen when I'm drawing, it's continuous. So we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Here we don't have a limit, so it can't be continuous. So at negative one, what kind of discontinuity is it? Jump. Yeah, it's a jump. Because you have to jump down to here to get there. And then at zero, the limit doesn't exist. Um, we didn't really have a name for this discontinuity. So it's just not, this is just not continuous. And then at x equals one, the limit exists, but it's not continuous. What do we call that? Removable. Yeah, that's a removable discontinuity. And then at two, the limit didn't exist. And at that point, we have an asymptote. And then everywhere else, you're fine. Any questions on part B? 
Okay, part C is where is it di not differentiable? So the first thing is if it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. Are there any other points where it's not differentiable? Negative two. Negative two, because on the left, the derivative is one. On the right, the derivative is zero, so they don't meet each other. You do a sudden change of slope when x is negative two, and that means it's not differentiable. And then it also wasn't where it's not continuous, so negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Any questions on question number three? Which is the longest to talk about. Okay, question four. Evaluate the following limits or state the limit does not exist. Show your work. Okay, so what are you always supposed to do? Very first thing. Plug in. Yeah, plug in. So I'm gonna just plug in in my head because that's pretty easy for me at least. Two squared is four plus two is six minus six is zero. Two squared is four times three is 12. 12 plus two is 14, minus 14 is zero. So I get zero over zero. When you get zero over zero, what does that mean you have to do? Do your algebra. Yeah, we're gonna do algebra. And the good news is when you get zero over zero and you have a rational expression, then it's easier. So what we can do, we still have this first bit, bit still have the limit as x goes to two, and then we're gonna have a fraction and because we know that when we plugged in two, you got zero, we know x minus two is going to be a factor for both the numerator and the denominator. So I don't have to do any thinking. So x minus two, I must be x to get x squared. And then I have that to be plus three because negative two times three is six, is negative six. Same idea on the bottom, we have x minus two. And then I need to multiply by three x to get the three x squared. And then I had to multiply by plus seven to get the negative 14. And I could foil and check, but I, I know it's gonna be correct because of theory. Okay, then the good news is the minus x minus twos go away. So x minus two is gone. And then I just plug in and I get five over 13. Just plug it in. Any questions at all on part A? I guess I should write A, just make it a little more clear. Let's look at part B. Part B, we're supposed to plug in one and see what happens. Well, I get three. Minus two, that's one. And I get one minus one is zero. What's one over zero? Undefined. Yeah, undefined is fine. I'm gonna write D and E because that's what we're used to. Any questions on that? C. So B was supposed to be very easy. You just plug it and you're done. Okay, C, if you plug in, you get sine of zero over zero, sine of zero, zero. So that means we have to do algebra. In this case, we're gonna let U equal three X. And if U is three X and X is equal to U over three. And one over X is equal to three over you. So now that I've done that, I can do the limit. So we have the limit as x goes to zero of sine three x over x. Well, if x goes to zero and u is three x, then u goes to zero. Three x was u. And one over X is three over U. Now what's the limit 
as u goes to zero of three times sine u over u. And the idea is I can take the three out with the limit as u goes to zero of sine u over u, and that one you're supposed to have memorized. Y'all remember it? I don't see y'all jumping in. Yeah, that's just one. So three times one, you better know, you don't need a calculator for that, three. Any questions on question number four? Okay, question number five. Determine which of the following was the intermediate value theorem applied correctly. Explain your reasoning. Okay, so notice in part A, what's the problem with f of x equals x minus four over x minus one? There's a big issue with it. What's the issue with that function? When x is one, one is in the interval of zero and two. Yeah, and what's the problem with x equals one? In a word? Well, it, it or can't two. equal zero because zero goes in the denominator, so then it would be undefined. Yeah, but in particular, what's the, what, what are the two words we use? F is not continuous because that's what the IVT needs is continuity at x equals one. So the IVT um, does not apply. Any questions on part A? Okay, for part B, notice first F is continuous. I'll try CTS. So we check that. Now we gotta look at f of zero. What's f of zero? Zero. Yeah, um, f of zero is zero, because cosine of zero, cosine, well, no, one more time, what's f of zero? What's cosine of zero? Zero. What's cosine of zero? <laughs> one, cosine of zero is one. You need to have that one in your brain. So sine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero. So we get one minus zero equals one. What is f of two? Okay, that's gonna be cosine of two minus two. And you're not supposed to necessarily know exactly what that number is. All that matters because we want to we want to look at f of c equals zero, is is it is it negative? How do I know this is negative? So we know because the cosine of x always stays below two. In fact, it never gets bigger than one. That's something you learned from trig. So that means cosine of two minus two has to be negative. So now we know, therefore, zero lies in the interval. From f of zero to f of two. So, the IVT applies. Any questions on that? You have to make sure you're continuous and you have to make sure the, the, the Y value you're interested in is in between the left and the right, which we know because the left is positive, the right is negative, and zero is in between positive and negative. Any questions on part B? Okay, let's look at the next one, number six. We're getting through. Prove using the epsilon delta theorem. This was an error on my part, and I accepted it if you caught the error. I also accepted it if you didn't catch the error, but you use epsilon delta proof, and I gave full credit either way. 
I think I'm gonna do the proof way because that's really what I meant. And to be honest, remember I talked to you um, the, the class before the exam and you wanted a shorter test. So the original problem was much messier than this. It had an equal negative one, but, the, but it wasn't just two X plus one. And I changed the left-hand side and forgot to change the right-hand side. So sorry about that. Um, so first thing, the limit isn't negative one. So if you, if you caught that, I figured it was my mistake. If I, you just said it, it doesn't work, then that's good. If you found the limit as X goes to negative three using epsilon delta, that's even better because then you're actually using epsilon delta. Either way, you get full credit. So I'm gonna do the epsilon delta proof that it's equal to negative five is what it should be. So sorry about the typo. Um, it's one of the problems with tests where we're not in class together because someone would have noticed it, said it, I would have written on the board. But when you're on, you know, by yourself, I, you know, I'm not there to like tell everybody and stuff. So I can't do anything even if I find the error while you're taking the test. So yeah, I wonder if it's just, a, just like a weird definition of uh, delta uh, being epsilon over two plus two. <laughs> Yeah, um, what I pretty much, I wanted to make sure that you're using the epsilon delta definition appropriately. I needed to see, and I'll, I'll write it out in a bit, the key words, or I needed to see you catch my mistake, and that was fine too. And I gave you full credit for either of those two approaches. Catch my mistake, and then I gave you full credit, or do an epsilon delta proof correctly, and I gave you full credit. Um, so let me do, so again, one thing is you plug in you could plug in negative three, you get negative five, and you say it doesn't work, false, done. Um, but again, that's a trick question. I try not to give trick questions. This was a mistake, so I apologize on that. But if you didn't do that, if you didn't see that, and you just found the limit, then that works too. And the idea here is the limit should be negative um, five. So what we want to do is we want to say, do the scratch work first which is not a part of the proof, but it kind of helps, okay? So scratch work is we're gonna take the absolute value of what? Fx minus L. Negative five, yeah. So we're gonna take um, two X plus one, and then minus a negative five. And that is e and that is less than epsilon. I'll just use e for epsilon. It's not perfect, but it's just faster for writing. So that means that um, that's two x plus six. is less than epsilon, divide by two, and we get x plus three is less than epsilon over two. And that is the same as x minus negative three, because that's what we need, is less than epsilon over two. So now we're ready for the proof. What is the very first word you must have in the proof? And I said this multiple times, let. If you didn't have the word let, yes, I took off points. Okay, because that was important. So let epsilon be greater than zero. Then choose uh, delta is too high. This. I'm going to go delta. Delta equal epsilon over two. Any questions so far? Okay, and then we just go then if. And then we always start out with x minus c is less than delta. 
the absolute value. X minus C is less than delta. implies that, and then C was negative, um, C was negative three, and delta is epsilon over two. So I'm gonna copy and paste. X minus a negative three is less than epsilon over two. Any questions so far? Thus, and I can take that, paste it in and play with it. So I'm gonna realize that's x plus three, I'm gonna multiply by two. So I'm gonna put a two out here and go plus three. and it's less than epsilon. Any questions so far? Hence, put the two through. Whoops, I don't want it, just one more time. So the, it becomes 2x plus 6 is less than epsilon, and we're almost there. Therefore, and then again, the 2x plus 6 becomes a 2x plus 1 minus 5 is less than epsilon, or minus negative 5. Or now we can rewrite this. Oh, missed it. One more time. Come on. And 2x plus 1 was f of x. And negative 5 was our limit. OK, what should the last step be in every epsilon delta proof? How does it end? that you proved it? Yeah, so we can conclude that and it is it's basically this except that it's supposed to be a negative five instead of negative one that was a typo. And there's the proof. Any questions at all on this proof? Okay, let's move to number seven. We're almost done. <laughs> A few more.
Find the derivative using the limit definition. All right, what three letters must be on every step? L-I-M. And what did I tell you is gonna happen if I don't see L-I-M on every step? Be docs. Uh-huh, was I honest? Some of you don't know because you wrote the L-I-M, but those who didn't, was I honest? <laughs> did I take off points? Yes. Okay, that is necessary. Okay. If there was an algebra step or two that you just went fast on, that's that's okay, but LIM needs to be in every step. Okay. So we're talking three over X. So let's go ahead and quickly do it. So we're gonna take F prime of X equals the limit as H approaches zero of, and it was three over X. So the way it works, if you remember, is you have a fraction, you have F of X plus H, that's gonna be three over X plus H minus three over x all over h. Any questions so far? Okay, I could take that and I can multiply it by the common denominator of the numerator. I'm going to multiply it by x times x plus h. And this is x times x plus h. If you multiply in the numerator, you're going to multiply in the denominator. Any questions on that? Okay, so now what I can do is a little algebra. So we limit as h goes to zero. When I multiply three over x plus h times x times x plus h, I get three x. When I multiply um, three over x times x times x plus h, I get three times X plus H. And then I still have X times X plus H. And as I warned you um, in class, you never want to deal, you don't want to touch the denominator. Just leave it. Equals. I'm just gonna copy and paste. Then what I can do is multiply through and subtract. 3x minus 3x is zero, and then we have a minus h. So the top just becomes minus h. Any questions on that? Equals. All right, the h is cancel. Get a negative one on top, this h is gone. And now, what do you always do after you cancel? Plug in. Plug in. Plug in h equals zero, and you get one of negative. Oh, sorry, I lost a three there. And there. And when you plug in, you just get negative three over x squared. And there's the answer. Any questions at all on problem seven? Okay, let's look at problem eight. Okay. Suppose you had the opportunity to take a spaceship to the moon and then threw a, bat, a baseball. Okay, the position of the baseball followed this equation, where S is the height of the baseball above the surface of the moon measured in meters, and T is the time in seconds after the baseball left your hand. Use a limit definition to determine the acceleration. I want to ask you something. When you hear the word acceleration, what should you be thinking? In calculus. The second derivative. Okay, so we need the second derivative. Okay, you're not done after finding the first derivative. A lot of you thought you were, but you need a second derivative. 
So to find the second derivative, you first find the first derivative, and then you find the second derivative. So now let's go ahead and deal with that. So I'll just copy this guy. And let's play. So now we want s prime of t. And for that, we're going to take a limit. Because I said limit definition, which means you need to have the limit. h approaches zero of, and then we're going to have a fraction. And now we're going to have, a, instead of a t, we're going to have t plus h everywhere. So I'm just going to copy this sucker in, kind of paste, paste it. And where I see a t, I'm going to put a t plus h. And then I'm going to subtract. the function and divide by h. Any questions on that so far? Okay, then we're going to do some algebra. It's not that messy. I mean, it's not, not beautiful, but it's not too bad. So we're going to have a negative 0.8 times t plus h squared t plus h squared is t squared plus 2th plus h squared. Then we get a 30t plus 30h. And then we're going to have a minus, a minus. So basically, I'm going to take the, all the signs and change them. The minus becomes a plus. The plus becomes a minus. And this plus also becomes a minus. Any questions so far? No. OK. I didn't get a very minor thing, but let's look, make it pretty. Put an equal sign. So now let's simplify. And the idea is we can get rid of all kinds of stuff. So first, I see a negative 0.8t squared and a plus 0.8t squared, gone. OK? So what I can do is I can replace all this with negative 0 0.8 times 2. And 0 0.8 times 2 is 1.6th. And then we have a minus 0.8 h squared. OK, so now we dealt with that part. That's gone. And this guy, the 0.8 t squared, is gone. We have a plus 30 t and a minus 30 t. They're gone. We have a plus 2 and a minus 2. They're gone. It's getting prettier, isn't it? OK, now what I can do is I can factor an h out because everything has an h. So I can write h times, and we're, we're left with uh, negative 1.6t. And then uh, minus 0.8h and then plus 30. Okay, we're getting there. Equals. 
So now the H's go away. And then we plug in H equals zero. And you get negative 1.6 T plus 30. Any questions on this work here? What is that, by the way? Speed, What's, the velocity. Yes, yeah, the velocity. It turns out it's not the speed. The speed is the absolute value of the velocity. Um, so it's because if you get a speeding ticket, that you never go negative miles an hour. <laughs> so, but if you get a velocity ticket, that'd be different. So it's a velocity. And the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity because it's a second derivative. So now finally, our acceleration, I'm gonna write A of T is equal to, and again, we have a limit as H approaches zero, and we get a fraction, it's the same idea. Yeah, my velocity was negative. That's not gonna get you out of a ticket, by the way. <laughs> okay, and we have a negative 1.6 um, T plus H. And then we had a plus 30, and then we have a minus, and then we have a negative 1.6 T plus 30 all over H. And I think this one we can do, or at least I can do a little bit in my head. So it's not that bad. So notice we get a negative 1.6 T minus a negative 1.6 T, those go away. So we have a negative 1.6 H And then the 30 minus the 30 goes away. So it all of a sudden became pretty. And that, the H's cancel, is the limit of negative 1.6 over 1. And now plugging in means you just calculate. So that's equal to negative 1.6. Any questions on that? Okay, by the way, um, just a note, what is the acceleration on Earth? Who knows it? In, me in uh, meters per second squared. If you've had any physics, you know. Yeah, negative 9.8, right? Um, so that is actually the reason why if you were on the moon and you jumped, you would go really high because there's very little acceleration on the moon. So it's really easy. If you ever watch those, um, unfortunately it's been 50 years or something since we've been there. But if you ever watch the videos, it's really cool to watch them jump up and see them just go up really high, even though we're, we're, they're wearing uh, really heavy space suits and they can still jump really high. So it'd be fun to go there someday. Any questions at all on this, no, this problem? Okay, so the last regular problem, and this is a true-false question, and that is part A is if, if f prime of 9 is 4, then the limit as x goes to 9 of f of x exists, and f of x is continuous at x equals 9. What do you think, true or false? True. True. And that is because f prime of 9 is 4, means the derivative exists. If the derivative exists, the function is continuous and the limit exists at that point. We had a theorem about that. 
So very simple if you know what to do. And if you don't, you have no chance. Okay, so part B, if f of two is three and f of 2.01 is 3.01, then round it to two decimal places. F prime of two is one. What's, what's the problem with this? You have two points, but you don't know if they're continuous in between. Yeah, you don't know anything, actually. All you have is two points. So the secant line. Wait. That's better. The secant line is just a guess. that may or may not be right. So for example, the slope could be anything on the left. And then if it was not near one, the function is not even differentiable, okay? Or the derivative is not one. So that's false. Notice by the way, way up near the top. Here's an example where you could calculate perfectly the slope of a secant line to the right, but that does not mean the derivative is that value at all. Do you see that? Even you can go really close to the right and your secant line will have a slope zero, but the derivative is not zero. So I, I figured I'd show you an example because we already had one. So that's why this is false. Let me give you an example in the real world that was a big deal in physics. And that is if you go 0.1, say you go 0 0.01 times the speed of light, I say 0 0.99 times the speed of light, so you're almost there. Are you getting really close to approximating all the things like mass and energy when you hit the speed of light? Anyone know the theory on that? And the answer is absolutely not, okay? You have to take a lot of energy to get close to the speed of light, but, you, but it's not even continuous at the speed of light. So that's an example. Um, but there's lots and lots of examples like that. Okay, then there's the last question, X credit problem, which I gave 15 points. So in a way you got 14.99 points of X credit if you answered this. And write down one thing you instructed to do to improve the class, one positive thing that has helped you. I figured I'd show you what the results were. Here. All right, let's try again. Okay, so what I did is I um, tabulated kind of what people wanted, how to improve, type. What you hated the most was the fact you have to type out your answers. Just don't know what else I can do about that. Because if you don't using Proctoria, if not doing it at the computer, then you could just, I don't know, use someone else or Photomath or something like that, and get all the answers done for you. So I, there's just no way of me like making this work. Um, what I'm hoping for is spring quarter we'll have a vaccine and we'll all be back. And then I promise you, you'll be writing it on paper. <laughs> so that was the biggie. Same thing with exams on the computer. There are a lot of you that said that. Uh, 
Some of you wanted more time on quizzes. What I might do is not give you more time, but maybe make them a little shorter. I'll try and do that. So that's something I can do. If I give you more time in the quizzes and we have less time for lecture, and then you're not getting examples, and some of you wanted more examples. So more worked out examples. So I can't do more of everything in the amount of time we have. Um, only one person wanted the homework to be longer. I figure if I if I caved in on that one, um, there might be some people that weren't so happy if I made your homework really, really long. But maybe if y'all want it longer, I can do that. But just um, a few things. Allow practice on the proctorial calculator. The bad news is I can't even practice on it. The good news is you didn't need it for this test. Did you realize that? Did you see me use it at all? So I was very careful when I wrote this test that you do not need the calculator as long as you could do basic arithmetic like four minus two. Okay, and I assume you can do that. So I'm gonna do everything I can to make it so that the arithmetic that you have to do will be very simple. So that way you don't really need the proctorial calculator for the exams. And the exams are the only things you should stress out about. Does that sound fair? Okay, you may not have noticed it. Okay, I think having the yeah, quiz account for less credit. Good. The quizzes are hardly any credit at all. I don't know if you realize that. Do the calculation. One quiz is like nothing. So it really is less credit. Yeah, so that should leave stress out. So if you feel like there are a lot of credit, if I divide it by two, the amount of credit, it would still feel like a lot because it's already nothing. It'll be epsilon over two instead of epsilon, as we say in calculus. There's very little Isn't credit it, on the quizzes. Aren't, aren't the quizzes the same percentage as the homework of our overall grade? Yeah, neither of those are very much of anything. Okay, got it. All your combined quizzes, all of them, is less than 10% of your grade. Does that make sense? So you take you take seven and a half percent is what it is and divide by, I don't know, something like 25 quizzes, it's nothing per quiz. Does that make sense? And similar with the homework, it's almost nothing. Okay, but the big the big points for the grade are your exams. So that's what you should definitely be thinking about. Um, make the webinar longer. I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> There's like college rules about that because then the I can't require you to be there longer. But what I do, and I always do this, is I always have office hours after. And I pretty much stay around until you guys are done. So I'm always happy to answer questions or do more examples. You just have to ask. And I'll do that today too. I always do that. Okay. So that's the thing is I'm not allowed to make the webinar longer, but what I do is I cheat and have my office hours after, and then you can you can get more stuff out of it. Um, so again, again, you hate the fact that we're on a computer and I can't do anything about it. I'm gonna work on this microphone thing. I am struggling. I have tried, this computer does not like a microphone. Um, there's one more at the college I'm gonna try. I have to wait till next Friday. I'm not allowed there um, except on Fridays. Maybe I'll try that. Um, by the time I read this, it wasn't, the college is already closed. Um, and see if that'll work. The microphone I have in my here for my smartphone doesn't work on this computer. So sorry about that. Technical issues. Um, and the last one, this one here, I am so into that. I want to be back and I am hoping, but I, it's not my choice. Even the president's got COVID now. So we need a vaccine. That's all I can tell you. When we get a vaccine, then we're back. Okay, or at least once the next quarter starts. Uh, things that went well, the biggie is you like having the lectures recorded. So uh, please, because a lot of you like this, and the four means four if you said that. If I forget, or you don't hear this meeting is recorded, tell me, like today, it was a little late to get it recorded. So if you remind me, it will get recorded. If you don't, I might forget. Usually I try to remember, I always try to remember. But if I forget, please remind me and then I'll record it. Okay. So like today, I, that, it was because because of this whole video thing. I was, my mind was messed up to deal with the video. Okay. Um, office hours right after class you like. And again, I'm going to keep doing that. that. That's not going away. 
Okay, so there'll always be office hours after class. Okay, pretty much through December. Um, and then a whole lot of things, again, I mentioned, I'll let you read through these, but I mentioned ones that were multiple people can talk about. Okay, any questions about anything before we move to doing this section, which is a very important section, um, but it's not that hard. There's two important formulas we're gonna get to in a moment. Any questions before we move to it? Okay, so what I wanna do now is I wanna look at the product rule. So let me tell you what that's all about. Oops, I gotta dismiss this. There we go. Okay, so this is called the product rule and it's really important. And it's important, which means I'm going to make it 30 point font. It comes up all the time. And it says the following that f of x is g of x. the differentiable function. Then, what we want to do is want to say, well, what if we want to take the derivative of the product of f of x and g of x. So if we have two functions and we multiply them and we want to take the derivative and we don't want to have to do a whole lot of algebra, we just want to be able to find the derivative. How do we do that? And here's what you cannot do. It's not just f primes times g prime. I will promise you, if you do that, I will take off so many points on any exam or quiz that you've got. Okay, so don't do that. There is a formula that's messier and don't get mad at me that it's messy. It's not my fault, okay? It just is what it is, it's math. And oops, it's the following. And it's not that bad. And what it is, is it's F prime of X times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. I'm gonna write, memorize this, got it? So there are some things in this class that need to be memorized and this is one of them, okay? The product rule is the, is the other big one for, the, for say exam two. I'm I mean, sorry, the, this is a product rule and the other one was the power rule. But that was easier. That was just n x to the n minus one it was the derivative of x to the n. But this is the derivative of f times g is f prime times g plus f times g prime. Any questions on the big theorem, the big product? Okay, so let me do an example. So find the derivative of, let's go ahead. x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus x plus 5 times x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth 
plus 3x minus 8. Okay, without, but if you didn't know the product rule, you still could find the derivative. What would you have to do? And you'd probably be um, getting eating Kleenex to uh, wipe off the tears. You'd have to expand that, okay? And I don't think any of you want to expand that sucker. Okay, am I right? But with the product rule, this is actually not that hard at all. So the answer is, well, let's just do it. So it says take the derivative of the first function f. Well, that we can use a power rule for. And that is going to be 4x cubed. And then we're going to have a minus 9x squared. And then plus 1. Any questions so far? Times g of x. Well, because I'm typing, I can copy and paste it. So I just multiply by g of x. And then plus f of x. So let's copy and paste f of x. And then times g prime of x. And that is going to be 5x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 3. And that's it. I'm done. Any questions on this? Do you all agree that this was a whole lot easier than expanding the sucker? Okay, this took what? 30 seconds to do? Expanding would have been really long. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to do it. No way. So having it um, just end up in this long form, that's, that's like, that's it? Yeah, so here's my rule of the class, by the way. The rule of the class is you must do all the calculus. Because what's the name of this class? Calculus. Call this class? Calculus. calculus. So you better do the calculus. And by the way, oh. um, ca calculus is limits, derivatives, and integrals. Okay. Of those three, there's one word you don't know. What is that? Integral. Integrals. Guess what next quarter is? <laughs> Yeah, next quarter is integral calculus. So this quarter is derivatives, and next quarter is integrals. And limits kind of come in both. So just let you know, the very last day of our class, we do integrals. But basically, you spend the entire time next quarter doing integrals. Just like we're going to spend just about the entire time this quarter doing derivatives. On the other hand, algebra, I'm assuming you all know algebra. So I'm not going to test you on algebra. I'm going to test you on calculus. And I want to make sure you can do the calculus. The only reason why you need to do algebra in this class is to be able to get to the point where you can do the calculus. Okay, so like on the quiz today, you had to do a little algebra or you couldn't have done the calculus. Any questions on that? All right, we have a big theorem and when you have a big theorem, you need to have a proof. And if we're gonna do a proof, we have to use a limit definition, okay? Whether you love that definition or not, we're using it. So it's the limit. So it's the limit as H approaches zero of, and now what we do is we have plugging in x plus h into the original f of x, g of x. So we're going to go f of x plus h times g of x plus h all over h. Uh, sorry, and I have minus f of x, g of x. Isn't that the definition?
Okay, now what I need is a rabbit. I don't think I've said that to you guys before. You wanna know what I'm talking about? Okay, so here's why I need the rabbit. Because if you ever watch a magic show, then all of a sudden a rabbit comes out of the hat out of nowhere, right? And that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some magic. And I'm just gonna put about basically do some stuff, makes it look worse, but it's not, it's gonna be better. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract f of x times g of x plus h. And I'm going to add f of x times g of x plus h. Are you all convinced I'm allowed to subtract and add the same thing? Right, any questions on that? That I'm allowed to do it? Okay, do you all agree it's basically magic? It's like, why in the world would I do that? Okay, I just took something that, that looked kind of messy and now I made it really messy. Okay, and the reason is the following. Is I can take that and cut it into two pieces. is I can do the first two plus the second two. Are y'all okay with that algebra step? Okay, then what I can do is I can take the first one and realize in the numerator, I have a G of X plus H. I can factor that out. And similarly for the second one in the numerator, I have f of x. So I can factor that out. So I'm gonna take this f of x plus h, I'm sorry, the g of x plus h, and I'm gonna factor it out. And similarly, I'm going to take the f of x and I'm going to factor that out. Any questions on that bit of algebra? Okay, the good news now is I'm pretty much done. I just have to write down the answer. Okay, so now let's take a look at what we have. So what is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h? You're all supposed to know that. What is this first part? What's the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h? What's the first derivative? Yeah, that's f prime. And then if I plug in zero for h on the second piece, I just get g of x. Do y'all see that? There's g of x. I'm going to go plus, and then I see an f of x, 
that's here. There's no h in it, so it's just f of x. But once the limit as h goes to zero of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. You're all supposed to know that too. That's just, yeah, it's g prime of x by definition. And that's a full proof. So it's one of those proofs where, I mean, knowing to do this, to subtract and add this messy stuff, that's pretty hard. But if you, if you pull that rabbit out of the hat, then everything's easy. Any questions on this? Any questions? Okay, so now, I have a poem for you. Okay, what I want you to do, and I know some of you want to stay on mute, but you don't have to, is I want you to repeat it with me a bunch of times. Okay, it's a poem, and if you can, if you get this poem down, your life is going to be so much easier. It's low D high minus high D low, square the bottom, and away you go. So I'm going to say it a few times because I want it to be one of those poems that never gets out of your head, no matter how painful that is. Low D high minus high D low, square the bottom and away you go. Low D high minus high D low, square the bottom and away you go. Low D high minus high D low, square the bottom and away you go. I want you to chant this over and over and over again so that it's in your head forever. And let me tell you why. And this is called the quotient rule. Also, it should be a big font. And that says the following. If you want to find the derivative And you want to find the derivative of a quotient, f of x over g of x. Then that is equal to, and now we do the poem. What's the low? Right, that's g of x, right? What's d high? That's f prime of x minus, the high is f of x, d low is g prime of x. And then we need to square the bottom, g of x squared. And away you go, because if you say away you go, you won't get it backwards, because uh, if you get it backwards, it doesn't rhyme anymore. That's the whole point of that, and away you go, you're done. So this is, the, this is a big theorem. So we now know how to find the derivative of a product, and we know how to find the derivative of a quotient. Any questions on that so far? Okay, very important, okay? And um, this is one of those, um, I could prove it, but it's a whole lot easier to prove it using something called the chain rule which we're gonna have a whole day on. And then it's really easy, no problem. Um, proving this without that is a pain, I don't wanna do it. So the important thing is you just memorize it. The proof of the quotient rule and the product rule, that's my job. The using it, that's your job and my job. So let's do an example. So find the derivative of Obviously. 
x squared minus 3x plus 1 over x squared, how about 4x squared, plus 3. Any questions on the question? All right. And the good news is we just do it. So now we go ahead and do the poem. So we're going to have a fraction. What's the low in this case? Four x squared plus three. Mm -hmm. This is not a trick question, by the way. Four x squared plus three. Okay, and then d high is going to be two x minus three, and then minus high, and the high is x squared. Minus 3x plus 1 over, oh, sorry. So that was, so it's low d high minus high d low. That's going to be 8x all over 4x squared plus 3 squared. Any questions on that? No big deal, right? Where did the okay. yes. come from? What's that? The like 2x put minus 3 and 8x, where did that come from? Ah, so in the, in the poem or the rule, we're supposed to take the low, which is 4x plus 3, times the derivative of the high. So if you take the if you take the x squared minus 3x plus 1, you take its derivative. Derivative x squared is 2x. Derivative of 3x, negative 3x is negative 3. Derivative of 1 is 0. That's the 2x minus 3. And then this 8x was the derivative of 4x squared plus 3. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So as I mentioned, that power rule, if you don't know the power rule, you can't do anything. Are you noticing that? It comes up everywhere. So that's what I use as a power rule. Okay, one last example. Find the values of x where the function f of x equal function. x minus 1 over x squared plus 2 have a horizontal tangent line. OK. So as we saw on the exam, if you have a horizontal tangent line, what do you know about something in calculus? We don't have much time, so we know the derivative must be zero. If it's horizontal, that's slope zero, so that means the derivative is zero. So we find the derivative. So let's do it. So f prime of x equals and again, we go ahead and we take the derivative, which is fraction. So it's low x squared plus 2 times d high, which is just 1, derivative of x minus 1 is 1, minus high, which is x minus 1. times d low, which is 2x. 
Square the bottom. And away you go. Any questions so far? Well, if the horizontal tangent line, this better be equal to zero. If a fraction is equal to zero, what do you know about something? The numerator would, well. The numerator is zero. We don't have to worry about the denominator. And we can just get that numerator and set it equal zero. So I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna multiply the numerator out, x squared plus two. And then we're gonna have a minus, and we'll have a two x squared. And then we're gonna have a minus a minus two x, so plus two x. equals zero. Okay, and then basic algebra, I'm going to um, combine my terms and multiply by negative one to make it look a little prettier. So notice we have x squared minus two x squared is negative x squared. Multiply by negative one, you get x squared. Then we have minus two x minus two equals zero. Any questions so far? Okay, um, this doesn't factor nicely, but there is something called a quadratic formula. So x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So let's do it. So that's 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 4, minus 4ac which is plus eight, all over two. And that is equal there we go, to, well, the nice thing is the twos cancel if you do it right, because this is root 12, root 12 is two root three. So that's just gonna be one plus or minus root three. And that's the hor that's why the tangent line will be horizontal. So here Didn't you say it was two root three? What's that? There's Didn't two root three was... over two though. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. Two. Yeah. So we got a root two. I, I did we're, I ran out of time. We're three minutes over. So I didn't want to, so I went fast, so sorry about going fast. But I figured it's arithmetic, it's not even algebra, there's no x's in that part. So I could go fast. But I am going to stop the share, stop the recording, but thanks for coming.